Be advised, the following episode contains content that may not be appropriate for all audiences. He's always bronzed. So, because it's white around the eyes, I'm going to assume two things. And I never really personally asked him. I don't need to know. It's pretty straightforward. He either gets spray tanned or he does tanning. He's a character. This is Diary of a Nation. I'm your host, Christina Zlotnick. My podcast explores the human experience in an effort to help us better understand one another. Chris Blevins has touched the face of every presidential candidate over the past eight election cycles. Okay, that sounds creepy. Scratch that. Since the early 90s, Chris has been the go-to makeup artist for every single one of our nation's presidential candidates. She owns Chris Cosmetics in Manchester, New Hampshire, which conveniently is located just down the road from WMUR, the only network-affiliated TV station in the state of New Hampshire, giving her and the station unique access to the candidates, since the state holds the distinction of the first in the nation primary. Chris, I met you back in the late 90s. I had just been hired as a meteorologist at WMUR, and my news director at the time, Karen Brown, sent me to you to get makeup for TV. And you and I haven't seen one another in decades, but you told me a few moments ago that you remember my energy. Yeah, everybody wears their spirit, you know, maybe like a two or three feet around them, you know, their energy field. And that's what I connect in and with over makeup. And so I tend to more remember energy. Sort of describing my relationship with makeup, which I think is other women's experience too. Not every woman, but my experience is it's a fraught relationship. When I was really young, I grew up in the Midwest and my mother would say, you shouldn't leave the house without makeup on. Some makeup. (laughs) And then I got into a few pageants. You did that too. You were Miss New Hampshire at one point. 1987. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And then I got into television. I knew I had to wear a lot of makeup for that too a little bit older and I got out of TV and had less time. It wasn't a priority, but I still felt polished when I wore it, but I didn't wear as much of it. And now that I'm in my 50s, I feel comfortable in my own skin without makeup, Mm. but I still want to get back to it. I wore it today, but I'm usually not wearing it during the week. That's because you were coming to see me. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So what do women tell you And what is the value of makeup to you? Makeup truly, if you look at what it is, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of where you are in your life and who you are in your life. And as women, we all have our own personal journey from being a young girl and the story that you just explained. A lot of women tell me that they weren't allowed to touch makeup or be near makeup. So what they do is they'd sneak it. And one of my favorite stories was from my grandma Rose, who told me that her mother would not, my great grandma would not let her wear makeup to school. So she would take a matchstick with her, light it on a rock halfway to school and then burn it out and use the charcoal to put on her lashes. Like they might do in prison. Yes. Or like whatever they had. Maybe what they did available. back in Egyptian times where makeup was born. So, like, I think most girls, young girls, can't wait to get their hands on makeup because they want to see how it will help them change or evolve in who they're becoming. And when you think about the journey of a woman, you think about, you know, all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're kind of 13 and you're a teenager. And there's a little bit of pressure like, who am I now? What am I turning into? What do I want to be? And we look outside ourselves at pictures and magazines and everything on, you know, online and, and kind of see what we like in other people and then try to maybe copy what they do. So at first, it's a lot of like, um, maybe having like sort of mentors in photographs or on TV, right? And um, trying different things and then waiting to see what happens with feedback. And I think feedback is a really big part of makeup because like I know a lot of young girls, they wear too much black eyeliner and then all of a sudden they come downstairs on their way out the door and the mother says, no way, you look like a tramp. You know, so all of a sudden now she's got some makeup trauma, right? She was told she looks like a tramp in black eyeliner. So she'll either rebel and wear more 
Or, you know, she'll tone it down and maybe go to a soft charcoal gray or her mom will bring her to somebody like me. And I'll sort of write a prescription for makeup. When I go to make somebody up, it's it's very little about the features I look at right away. It's more about like lifestyle, personality, or sometimes I'm actually helping somebody evolve into a new image, like being a weather girl on WMUR. Like, how do we want to project you? How do you want to project yourself to the world? And I think what's really important through our journey with makeup as women is that we're always asking ourselves, how could I best show my authentic self, you know, to yes. myself first in the mirror? but also then to the world so that makeup doesn't become a mask that you hide behind. It, it is such an awesome like talk about psychology, isn't it? Yes. It also gives me pause, though, the cultural expectations we have of women and how they should look. I feel – I'm going to use a very strong word here. I feel – I've been doing this for 33 years. I've been a makeup artist. And I'm not a big makeup wearer. I didn't get into it because I loved makeup so much. I loved transformation and creativity. And being able to work on a human canvas brought in that energy, brought in that. So I didn't get started to be a makeup artist because I loved makeup. I I was never like looking to see what the latest thing was or anything. I always expressed myself the way that I wanted to. I was always my own trendsetter. So that being said... I just kind of find that I'm devastated. That's the word I want to use. I'm devastated as as to what's happened with the beauty industry because of social media. And especially with young girls, like when I flip through Instagram and I see all these girls like perfectly made up, some of it's filters, but this full face of makeup, it's like there's so much beauty behind all that that doesn't get seen because everybody's sort of looking the same. And it looks like a mask. It does. And I think I think like, who are you underneath that? And why are you projecting this image? And one day you're going to have to meet your true self because life isn't just, you know, on social media. True life is when you're walking around day to day and how, how you're maneuvering in your relationships and you know, what you're going to do with your life and who you're going to be as a human being. And like, if there's an image out there one way and an image face to face another, then that separation right there, it takes a lot of work to bring it it into wholeness. So I'm concerned about youth right now. I mean, I look at it, I appreciate their skills and how much they've taken makeup and made it such a subject. But I hope they're not losing themselves in it. And I speak to the whole younger millennial population when I say that. And you talked about social media, but back in my day, obviously, we didn't even have computers or phones. But Cosmopolitan, that was a stressful magazine to look at, for example. They were photoshopped women. And my body could never look like that. My face wasn't going to look like that either. And that made me feel insecure as a teenager. Yes. There's a lot to live up to out there when that is what we have to live up to. And and the big reality of it is, is it's not real. It's not real. It's been altered. And a makeup is a way that we alter ourselves. But when you're talking about refinishing like a photo and putting it out there as an image that we're supposed to emulate as women, uh, it's unrealistic. And it drives that sort of like need to be perfect which we will always fall short. It's all about like people putting filters on. And and then it becomes really hard to like reveal a photo that's just authentically raw and real. But yet I, I know speaking for myself, those are the ones that I connect with the, the most because you can see an emotion. You can see emotion. You can see a life. You can see a story in somebody's true face. I think Dove Soap has done a really good job with that kind of marketing. Yes. Even though they're not a makeup company. And and this is where we're going as a business at Chris Cosmetics is is really going into authenticity in terms of like where we're headed with uh, self-care and kind of looking more at like skincare and makeup as a ritual and a ceremony of self and bringing it back to self, bringing it back to self-esteem and feeling good and self-care and acceptance. And makeup for me has always been about problem solving. Like whenever I sit down with somebody, I'm like, okay, when you look in the mirror and you have no makeup on in the morning, you know, what bugs you? 
Go ahead. Vent vent to me for a few minutes. My age spots. See? But all those things can be like corrected. And then what we do is we just correct the things that are unbearable. And then we celebrate everything else. And and like, I don't know, my voice has always been like inspiration for women to let them know that who they are and who they were created to be is just beautiful. And I can't tell you how many times I'm doing a makeup lesson on a 50-year-old woman that never knew what her best feature was. Like I'll say, your eyes are your best feature. And she'll say, really? No one's ever told me that. In 50 some years. And I, I like sharing the truth about what I see. I mean, I'll joke about the imperfections because I have them too, you know, but, but the beautiful things need to be talked about. And I think everybody has a right to know like what is beautiful about them from, from a perspective that isn't a normal person in their life. You right. Know? A third party. Third party. Independent. I love being that third party for, for women. I really do. So I'll be 53 next month. What do you tell women my age, especially ones who've gone through a lot of iterations of makeup over the decades? And personally, I'm just not sure what I should be doing now anymore because I've gotten some old habits. Right. Well, that's what's so good about like just stopping and like it's kind of like rearranging the furniture in your house and like really getting some more some better flow and feng shui for the way you live your life well your makeup is the same way so that's kind of one of my favorite parts of my job is these check-in makeup updates or moments with women at times of transition where they don't want to do what they've always done but they don't know what to do it's a real stuck point right it's an intuitive process you know, and I'm doing it virtually now, which is awesome. You know, our virtual um, makeup lesson is cool. I wrote this like long personality, like lifestyle questionnaire on features. You send a selfie and I don't feel any different sitting in front of somebody or sitting in front of a selfie with this form filled out. I can tell who the person is and it's allowed me to really, um, Really, like I said, write a prescription for that individual person because it is so personal. Makeup is very, very personal. So let's get back to what you said. You're going to happy birthday almost. I've got a happy birthday coming up in two weeks too. Going to be 56 years old uh, at the end of July. I'm going to talk. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about what you asked, but I'm going to talk about it because I'm going through the same thing that you are. And I have not at my age done anything any type of procedures. I have had no Botox. Zero? Zero. I've done a little Botox. I've done absolutely nothing. And I have just been relying on my skincare and makeup and acceptance and meditation and keeping life joyful and working on the inner stuff and staying relaxed and staying light filled. Okay. So it's like a, it's, it's like a journey of the spirit It's a journey of health, eating good, eating clean uh, to the best of my ability. (laughs) Sunscreen? Sunscreen, but I don't even use sunscreen because my mineral makeup is a natural sun protectant. So I've got no chemicals in my SPF. But it does the same thing. It does. Yeah. So sunscreen. Absolutely. There's there's so many different things that go into it. But like... We're always recreating ourselves. So like when when you're asking that question, it means like, I think I need to recreate myself. I'm wearing the same stuff that I used to do 10 years ago, and I'm in a different place. I've evolved even as who I am. So for me, what that means is um, as we age, upping the skincare routine, making sure that your skincare is is a ritual for you morning and night and that you know the things you need to do a couple times a week, you know, with exfoliation and all that and not being afraid to like find out what the perfect thing is for you, you know, getting into serums and understanding how they're going to work with the breakdown of collagen and elastin in your skin and all the things that are biologically going on with the aging process, not to mention hormones and postmenopausal stuff. No, I'm right there. So like, there's all these things we're changing, we're changing. But I know for me, I want to be a lot more simple in my makeup. Simple in life in general. Yeah, I want to brighten my eyes because the, th- the skin around the eyes gets more transparent. The eyes look a little duller. You know, everything's kind of pulling south. So like brightening up the eyes. Um, I just have a lot of techniques that I like to share with women to make their eyes look brighter as they age. And then um, a no makeup makeup look. And being able to really look like you're not wearing any, even if you are, 
so that you're showing that you're aging gracefully, that you're not wearing a mask. Too much makeup and aging is not a good thing. Harsh. It's not good. I don't want to feel it on my face. And I want people to look at me and see Chris before the makeup. And let's face it, makeup is an art that paints onto a canvas and the canvas is our face. So it's simultaneously as you're doing the right things with your makeup, you need to be doing the right things with your skin because the makeup will only look as good as as the skin underneath and the canvas needs to be the best it can be. Now, I want to talk to you why I haven't had any Botox or anything. I got traumatized at a makeup home party in Beverly Hills back in 2008, no, 2009, when I was doing a lot of travel work out that way, doing a lot of uh, clients out in the that area. I was working out of a salon part-time in Beverly Hills and kind of living between here, you know, Manchester, New Hampshire, and there. So I was at a home party. There were 18 women at it. And it was a full day event. And I was going to do like a group makeup lesson. And then I'd break off one by one, one on one with each of the women. Now they were in full Beverly Hills flair, fabulously over processed. Okay. I'm talking like real housewives style. I am. I'm talking that I'm talking a lot of procedures, all of them, but one, one sat in front of me and her face was extremely wrinkled. And she said to me, I had a financial hardship and I can't keep up with my friends. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that an 80-year-old woman looks like an 80-year-old woman. An 80-year-old woman that's had a lot of procedures and Botox and all that looks like an 80-year-old woman that's had a lot of procedures. So there comes a time where acceptance of the gift of aging must come. Now, for many women, it won't. They'll keep fighting it. They'll spend so much money, but they won't ever get to the place where they can be at one with the reality of the gift of every phase of life. And I always say, like, just off the cuff, I had my heyday. (laughs) So that, that woman changed me. She, so she said, they don't tell you that Once you start, you can't stop. And if you do, you're worse than when you started. Really? You're worse off? Yeah. No one talks about that. All these young girls, I I have clients now, they're they're in their late 20s and they're getting Botox. I'm like, why did you, why do you need to get Botox? You're perfect. But they're getting so, so, so like looking at everything under a close up mirror and microscopic that they're they're thinking it's preventative when really what they're doing is they're setting themselves up for almost an addiction to always doing something invasive and more and more and more. And where does perfection end? It can't because that standard can't be attained. So and is that what we really want? So it's insanity. And I don't buy into it. And I and that's why I haven't personally I decided I wanted to be a poster child, a poster woman, a poster crone at this point. A poster crone for no invasive measures, just good, wholesome living and see how I can arrive at self-esteem as I look in the mirror and see wrinkles, as I look in the mirror and see my my youth fading and still feel like I can celebrate Chris. I think there's more women that don't want to keep up with the outside stuff than we know about. And I hope they're listening. Why can't we just find a way to love ourselves right where we are and take care of ourselves with proper rituals and celebrate ourselves with the the perfect amount of makeup, just enough to make us feel like we're sparkling a little bit, going out the door, or even if we're not going out the door and it's just for ourselves. And, and, And then be happy there. But let me just add one thing. I know how to glam myself. I know how to bring it. And when I got to put on a cocktail dress and fancy sparkly earrings and bring it to a whole nother level, that's when I pour all that on. And let me tell you, it is really fun to transform yourself into your inner diva. And every woman should either have a makeup artist that can do that for them or be able to do that for themselves. It's called pulling out your power tools and your big guns. <laughs> I love that. And it's fun because then you show up mind blowing. You walk in and everyone's like, what? What happened to Chris? 
Like, whoa, girl. She turned it up to it's 11. It's really fun to do that. And I don't, have, I don't do too many gala events. I'm not that kind of girl. But when I do have to, I like showing up like, wow. Wowza. False eyelashes, the whole thing. A couple other segments of society. What do you tell men? And then what do you tell trans women oh. about makeup? Oh, I just love all this. I love all this. So what I tell men is skincare. Take care of your skin. I really, I mean, I let's face it. I make up more men usually during an election cycle than I do women. And it's all about making the skin look good. I wish men would start to feel comfortable wearing a little bit of concealer and foundation. It makes all the difference in the world. And it doesn't even color them the way that a bit of blush or a bit of lip balm no might. it evens out the imperfections of dark circles or redness or broken capillaries and just it's it's about like i look at it like this women we all start the same way we all create the canvas like with female makeup though what we do is we paint the canvas with men we just create the canvas make it look amazing and so i think skincare and um some light natural canvassing products that are no makeup makeup look which my stuff is all light reflective and mineral so it's like Really, you can't detect it with the eye. You can't see it, but it perfects. And and that's why it's good for HDTV. So it's it's very interesting time in Thank TV, God too. God, that wasn't around. Oh, yeah. We had to pancake back then, right? It was the pancake makeup. And now HD is like, it better be perfect or you can tell. I mean, but... But it requires less makeup, but more perfection in the application with HD oh, today. I didn't think of that. Way. Yeah, it takes more perfection in the application. It is it it has become like a it's it's a science of blending and balance, and like everything's under a microscope. But like with men, um, I I just want men to not think of makeup as a girl thing, and I'm talking about like being able to embrace self care as a man and want to look like good. And, and just, just allowing that. And like my husband would kill me, but I'm going to say this anyways. But when we go to gala events, he'll ask me for a little BB cream and I'll put a little BB cream on him. Why? Because he likes the way he looks with his skin, like evened out a bit, but no one can tell he's wearing makeup. And then we look great in pictures and we can be like, you know, a little power couple out at this great event. And it's really fun. And it's, it is like a behind the scenes thing. But so what? Isn't makeup a behind the scenes thing? We're usually one on one with ourselves in the mirror when we do it. But talking about like transgender and all that, I, I love it. I've been specializing in this for a very, very long time. A long time ago, a lot of um, a, a, a therapist that helps um, with the transition process through all facets of it um, came in here and I did her makeup for um, her book. And, um, you know, she said, I'm going to start sending you clients. And and so I've been doing uh, like this it, this – awesome rite of passage is helping somebody transition with makeup. It is the most valuable because it is so meaningful because you're bringing somebody with the art of makeup into their full identity. And it is one of my favorite parts of what I do here. I love it. I love the confidence. I like the change. I love the intimate conversation. I love understanding the process of, of thought. I love I love helping somebody embrace their true path and their journey. And that's probably one of the places where I feel the most powerful with my makeup brush in my hand. I had no idea you were so connected in that way. Yes, I am. I'm very connected to that community and I hold it very sacred. And and in most cases, you know, um, they will come in wanting no one to know they're here. It's a very behind closed doors. It's a very intimate conversation. And, you know, when they leave, we hug. And and it's just like creating a bridge for somebody into confidence. And to me, there's no greater gift that I could use my gifts, gift as a makeup artist in, in a situation other than that. Um, and I've had a lot of those kind of situations. Like I've had girls come in here that were battered or abused, that were very bruised, but still had to show up for life and needed to know how to cover it. I mean, I've, I've had, I mean, I'm an EMT as well. So like a lot of times there's situations that happen where people get badly burned or scarred and helping them recreate like a comfortable place with walking out into their life, um, 
is is probably where I hold the most um, like sacred place in me for the art that I can do and that I do. It's really hard to reach out and to even be able to find someone like you for someone in those situations. Well, makeup is a necessity in those situations. And for us, it is a necessity to a point, but more of a luxury. There are people where makeup is a necessity every day for them to be able to walk out the door and face the world. I believe it. Yeah. So how did you start your business, Chris? (laughs) Oh, it's kind of a, it's such a funny story. I, it's fate and destiny and there's no other way. I had no intentions of becoming a makeup artist. I went to college in London, England. I have a bachelor's degree in international marketing. I wanted to put on a suit and be a power chick and work on Wall Street and work in international marketing and business. And um, there, there was a boldness in me and that's what I had my vision on. But while I was over there, um, I was a child model and a young, you know, female model when I was in my, you know, teens and young adulthood. So when I was over in London, in order to make a little extra money, I did some odd modeling jobs over there, you know, did a couple fashion shows, a little print stuff, just to put a little money in my pocket, really, as a starving student, you know, in a city where I wanted to buy a lot of fashion. Trust me, lots of shopping, wanted to do lots of shopping. So I ended up getting a modeling job with the London School of Makeup. At the time, in the 80s, was the best makeup school in the world. Wow. People came from all over the world, all right, to study there and to become a makeup artist. And I did that for two years. And I sat in the chair and the teacher used my face to demonstrate every facet of makeup you can imagine, from photographic to, you know, glam to uh, theatrical. And in the theatrical part is really where I want to emphasize because this sort of bridged me into um, the next piece that led me to makeup artistry. Uh, Cats was really big in the theater in London in the 80s. And so they had a whole month of cat makeup. And so they turned me into a variety of different felines, which was really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I you can't help but sit and have it done to you and learn how. So um, it was it was just kind of fun. So I knew how to turn myself into a cat, basically. So I came back to the States and, um, and this was in 1987 and my mom was first runner up to Miss New Hampshire in 1963. Wow. Okay. It was in your genes. Yes. My great grandma was Miss Helsingborg, Sweden in 1902. Didn't know that either. Wow. I come from a lineage of Queens. (laughs) So she wanted me so badly to enter this Miss New Hampshire College scholarship pageant. And I was at New Hampshire College, which is now Southern New Hampshire University, finishing up two courses to complete my degree. So I said, Mom, what am I going to do? Now, she's she was an amazing dancer, okay? And my mom said, let, let me help you choreograph something creative. You know how to do cat makeup. Let's make your talent full cat makeup a gymnastics jazz routine to Jellicle Ball. And so uh, she put it together. And I was a pretty good gymnast and an okay dancer, but quite a character once you put the cat makeup on. So that became my talent. And I entered the local pageant and uh, did swimsuit, all that stuff, and ended up winning. It was the last preliminary of the year, though. So the next morning was the first rehearsal for Miss New Hampshire. So like a whirlwind, three weeks later, I'm competing in Miss New Hampshire. And I had to do the same cat routine and everything. I had no time to prepare anything else. And the judges said there was something about going from the cat routine to coming out in evening gown 10 minutes later, because I was the last contestant, And full glam that blew their mind. In a good way. In a good way. And like, how can she transform like that? You know? And my interview, I didn't care if I won or anything. So I was really confident. I was more like, what do you want to know about me? I'll tell you anything. Transparent. And I got crowned Miss New Hampshire that night. So my year as Miss New Hampshire, and it was like three months later, I'm on stage at Miss America, not really knowing how I got there, you know? And all the young girls that were vying for local crowns would... I started calling me the makeup girl because of the cat makeup, because of the glam makeup. So those were your first referrals. Yes. So I was called the makeup girl. And 
I didn't even put it together because I'm still thinking international business. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So this girl asked me if I'd help her design her makeup. I said, okay, I'll come over to your house. I sat at a kitchen table, her makeup, mine, showed her step by step, gave her the mirror when I was done. She started to cry. And I said, what is it? She says, I've never seen myself beautiful. And the instant that happened, I had a major life-altering white light experience. I will call it a spiritual experience. It, it was nothing short of miraculous. I felt very lifted out of my body. I felt very out of body. And a voice clear as day, had never heard a voice like this before, coming from in me, call it a higher self, I call it my makeup angel, said, it's not that really dramatic, but it, the voice said, you're going to be a makeup artist. And it was so life altering, that voice, it was a directive. You're so fortunate that that came to you so young. Yeah. People spend a lifetime trying to get to that place in their career. I was 23. Well, the Makeup Angels had a lifetime of amazing things planned in this path for me. And and to this day, I will people say, How did you get to do every candidate in the last eight elections and like work for the White House and like do all this? And it's like I didn't do a thing. I listened to that voice a long time ago and I did not question my life path or purpose because it was that profound. And I, I started doing makeup right right away. I picked up a makeup brush, not, not only just on my face, but that girl was my first makeover. Really, she was. And like, it changed everything for me. And within five years, I was working on my first presidential candidate and off and running to um, this phenomenal life path career that I've, I've lived in for 33 years. So we've danced around the political candidates for a long time. <laughs> yes. That's how a lot of people know you. And because of WMUR TV's position here in New Hampshire as the ABC affiliate and our position in the state as the first in the nation primary, that's a marriage where we get every political candidate come through the doors. And how did you get started as the makeup artist with Channel 9 and those political candidates that came as a result. I'm trying to remember how far back it went with Channel 9, probably from the very beginning. I used to have a morning show on WMUR called Beauty Inside and Out. And I did segments where I hosted different beauty things and everything way back in the day. But before that, I was working on Tom Griffith when he probably just started. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't even remember where that started, but I can tell you where my political career started. I started doing uh, makeup for photography first, and then I started doing TV makeup with WMUR, and then I had the first political makeover happen as a run-in. My ex-husband was in the men's room doing what guys do in a men's room, and next to him... Um, a guy was moving into the building where his business was, and it was Pat Buchanan's campaign manager. He was the first candidate then, right? So they got talking in the men's room, and he said, oh, yeah, we're moving the campaign office in here today. Um, oh, really? Well, if you ever need makeup, my wife does makeup. And he says, we need makeup tomorrow. And my first makeup job was Pat Buchanan for the cover of Newsweek magazine. <gasps> That's huge. 1991. The cover of the magazine. Yeah. And him and I, we hit it off so great. He said, would you, will you travel with me? The next morning, I was to do makeup for the first ever broadcast and meet the press wow. with NBC. That with, happened so fast. With Tom Brokaw. And you started right from the top. And Tim Russert. I made up Tim Russert the next morning. And then the producer was like, Chris, this is great. Now, I'm talking this is 1991. I have worked for NBC ever since. I ended up traveling with the special events with Tom Brokaw for 16 years, doing all this September 11th coverage, the Kennedy funerals. I mean, some historic, really weird, weird gigs where I look at my makeup brush going, what are we doing here? So all of this started with um, the men's room. And Pat Buchanan and him sort of mentoring me into the industry, whereas even the producers of Crossfire back then are now the big top dogs at CNN that became my boss when I got hired as chief of makeup for CNN. So like traveling the country with candidates and all that on the debate circuits um, all came from these relationships that have been built from the very beginning with a makeup brush in my hand. The intimacy, the connection. I know like... 
how I feel when I am in space with any human being is valuable to me. You have positive energy. You come across as very warm and loving and giving. And I'm 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 a businesswoman too though. Like I've got I've got fire in me. I'm a fire sign. I'm a fire. I'm I'm that, but when it comes to people, there's another side of me. It's compassion. Like I love to know people so that I can serve them well with what I do. So let's talk about more candidates after sure. Pat Buchanan. Then we get to Bill Clinton because uh, he was he was a governor of Arkansas at the time, and I remember making him up for for CBS for a morning thing at six a.m. and thinking to myself, "Wow, like so much charisma and like so much right? like energy and vibe, like." He was just like on fire, you know what I mean? And I thought to myself, wow, you know, like what was that? And 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 this is my experience with the candidates because I have such intimate connection with them all. And when I say I've made up every candidate in the last eight elections, I mean every single one. There is not one I have not done makeup for. And they all have a different like vibration. They all have a different – and, and so many of them, and I've said this to many of them behind the scenes, if only who you are behind the scenes when no one's looking was who you put in front of the camera, people would love you. That's impossible for some candidates, though. Yeah. Or very difficult yeah. for them. Well, isn't there a mask? And I think it has to do with power and it has to do with influence and it has to do with all that. But like deep down inside, if you're called to run for president... If you're called to do that, there is something incredibly amazing in your spirit. And to me, a lot of times um, they get too um, packaged in the marketing of themselves as a candidate to be able to let us know, the American people, when I say us, the American people know their true authentic self, which is going to be the one sitting in the Oval Office. Who are the ones that you believe have that in spades? Inside and outside, very much in tune. Oh, there's so many. Well, I used to always say that to Pat Buchanan. Pat, you know, I mean, I just, I wanted to just adopt him, you know, like his compassion and his warmth and all that. And then he'd get on TV and he'd be kind of a shark. And I'd be like, can't you just be compassionate when you go out there? You know, and like, what would he say? He just giggled at me. But no answer. Was, no, because there's a political game being played. Yeah, and, we see that. But but there are so many people that I, I can think of that wrapped their authenticity into their campaign. I mean, just this last Pete election. Buttigieg. Pete, Mayor Pete, definitely. Tulsi, Marianne Williamson. Oh, yes. I loved her. Like, it was like going to church when I heard her speak. Oh, I mean, the message. She did an amazing job intertwining her authenticity and her mission with and her politics. intelligence. Yes. Her spirituality. Yes. She was, she was very authentic. You know who was also pretty authentic outwardly, too? And I don't know why. I'm just speaking about names of people coming to me in vision that I just had so much fun with behind the scenes with John McCain, Senator John McCain. I miss him. Oh, he was just He's so... He's my authentic. kind of Republican. He was just so authentic. But then I think about the most sacred moment I've ever had with a candidate, and it's Barack Obama. I was... I never thought I'd ever... I always said, I'd love to do makeup in Hollywood one day, you know? And what do you know? The last debate um, when I was traveling with CNN was in Hollywood, California, in the Kodak Theater. I'm in the basement. And I'm waiting, you know, to to go into the green room of Barack Obama. It's the final debate between him and Hillary Clinton. And I, I walk into the room and I had been traveling, you know, for 18 months. So I'd made him up many, many times. And we, we had a great camaraderie between us, a comfort, I would say. And I, I went in and he was looking kind of like just dim, kind of like beat from the campaign trail as they all should be at that stage of the game. And I looked at him and I, I, I always saw him like with his um, one of his um, behind the scenes people, good friend of his, like doing a quick little prayer or something beforehand. And like I asked him, I said, are you prayed up? 
And he just looked at me and he goes, I could sure use more. And I sat down with him and we held hands and I led an open prayer with him. And I don't remember everything I said, but I do remember the thing I was saying when he perked up and like his spirit just all of a sudden instantly got revived. I said, remember the moment you were called to great purpose. And all of a sudden it's like he remembered why he was there and all the exhaustion, everything left. And I did his makeup. He went out, he had the debate of his debating (laughs) And, you know, just within a short time after that, won the presidency. And he said to me that night, he pulled me backstage after the debate. And he said, Chris, I got to thank you. I'll never forget what you did for me. And really, so what it comes down to when we're at our best performance, yeah, it's about how we look on the outside. It's about the message we deliver, but it's the state of our spirit. And when all those things are in alignment, amazing things happen. Don't we all want to live our life that way? You gave him a real gift that night. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why I was really there. And the makeup brush was the vehicle in which I found myself in the position to do the thing that I'm called to do, which is raise the vibration of those around me if they're willing. What are some other great stories you have? Oh, my gosh. Well, one of my most favorite ones was also in California, and it was with um, the Terminator Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, sometimes I'm just so busy and wrapped up in what I'm doing, I don't realize that Arnold Schwarzenegger is the governor, and I'm supposed to go out on the veranda at the Simi Valley uh, Reagan, you know, uh, theater or whatever, and uh, it's in the middle of the last, you know, Republican debate, and there's press everywhere, and I'm going out there because, like, I'm going to be making up John McCain, but I got to be out on the veranda to do the governor. And I'm totally not putting it together that it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. So all of a sudden, I'm seeing Secret Service coming in a head bopping. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, Don, like, you know, Don rises on Chris. (laughs) (laughs) Governor Schwarzenegger. (laughs) So, you know, sometimes it's really that simple. And so he comes up to me and everything's kind of in a rush and everything's heated and everyone's nervous. And the producer's like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And so I, I'm doing his makeup. He introduces himself. Um, he's looking out at the mountain range, zen as can be. Okay. Really? Like grounded, really like, calm. A, grounded like a rock. Good for him. Like a rock. Standing so buff and tall and strong and like just like powerful, you know? And I'm, I just speed up my game a little bit. And he grabs me by the wrist, looks me in the eye, and delivers a mantra to me that has been with me ever since changed my whole life he he looked at me and he goes chris <laughs> you scramble for nobody and i was like wow so i slowed down i turned around to my producer and he goes just take your time it's okay and you know everything worked out just fine even though i slowed down and what he taught me was do what you do mindfully and in the moment to the best of your ability, because that's the only way to be the best at what you do. And if you sacrifice by rushing, you will not do your best work. And everything in the universe will wait for you to finish your art. And I just don't scramble for people. It's it's about getting rid of people pleasing. It's a get and I use I used it right after. So I go down to John McCain's room and there's like 30 people in there buzzing around. He comes in and he's so funny. He sits down in the chair and his makeup at the time took a lot because he had cancer removed from the side right. of his face and there was a big scar. And like I need 15 minutes with him to do amazing work and that's what I need. So some stranger comes up to me that's thinks to somebody it was a little egotistical you know you can feel ego it's like yes and he was talking to me like kind of like well hurry up how much time are you going to need like can you hurry up can you get this done and i hadn't even started and i just stopped and i said i'm pulling out my new superpower i looked him and i go hey this is your candidate it's my candidate right now and quite frankly i don't scramble for nobody and he backed off like a puppy (laughs) and john mccain goes Chris, you take all the time you need to make up this old geezer. And he was just so funny. And I used the tool. <laughs> I'm not going to scramble. If you rush me and I don't do a good job and, and he goes out there and he doesn't look his best, that's on me. Right. And I'll never work again. He won't look good and you won't look good. And I've, I've had some tough – I had one tough situation. So let's get back to the Nixon-Kennedy debate, which you did not make up. Right. 
<laughs> but Nixon should have shaved and he should have let them put some makeup on him. Shoulda. They said he lost in part because of that, because the audience didn't believe he was all that Well, you look frazzled. Confident. Ma- male politicians not wearing makeup look frazzled on TV. Bottom line. It's not my fault. It's not but my fault. Al Gore Let me talk had about an unfortunate that. event. He Let had come to New Hampshire from Florida. So from, tell me that story. Yeah, and this was, oh, me and Mark Stein finally made peace. And I'll tell you what that's all about. And remind us who Mark Stein Mark is. Mark Stein um, is a contributor on Fox and other networks and wrote for Chicago Sun-Times and just a very powerful, powerful uh, pundit. Okay, so I, um, yes... It was the night of the debate in Boston, and I I had to make up both um, Bush and Gore and George W. Bush, George W. Bush and Gore, and back in two thousand, back in two thousand, and so Al Gore comes into uh, the room, and I've made him up many times. You know, I had been doing his makeup quite a bit, and I know his skin. And this day was definitely different. He had just gotten off. The plane, uh, Air Force One, because he was VP at the time, right? So he got in my chair and I said, what is going on? His face was hot as as a stovetop. And he had been out campaigning all day in the hot Florida sun with no sunblock on. And I, there were not going to be any commercial breaks, two-hour debate, no touch-ups. Wow, two whole hours yeah. with that red Grueling, face. Grueling, hot under the lights with the red face, which you know a sunburn gets worse and worse. So the first part of the debate looked pretty good, and then the the meltdown started to happen, and he just looked like a bright red whatever. And there was nothing more powerless than being backstage, looking at the screen, looking at what I needed to do. And unless I ran onto live TV in front of everything, I couldn't I couldn't maintain the perfection of what I would have wanted. And then came the whole aftermath after of blaming the makeup artist. Vicious. And it it was vicious. And Mark Stein was one of the ones that wrote one of the most, like, painful articles. Uh, Just slamming, slamming me. And, like, I was like, it wasn't my fault. My voice was nothing at that point. And I wrote to him and I tried to say, hey, can I tell my side of the story? Did he even know before he wrote what he wrote initially? No. No, I, I, he wouldn't hear the truth about the so sunburn. So he had half the story. Nobody knew the sunburn. They just saw the red. Yeah. And so it, it would be years later, a couple years ago, actually, that I was doing Mark Stein's makeup for a Fox hit. <gasps> it came back around. And I around. said, hey, Mark, I'm Chris Blevins. <laughs> and you, you wrote some stuff that wasn't true. And uh, I'm, I'm that girl. I'm that girl. And he made a formal amend to me, a formal apology. And and that's one of the many reasons why I don't always believe everything that I read and hear. Because like the truth lies somewhere in the middle, in the middle. And there may be more than two sides to the story. There may be five. Listen, that kind of those kind of experiences make me really happy to be able to claim that I'm an independent bipartisan. And just to stay in the middle and discern the truth, discern the truth, like with my spirit. It's not everything that's said and done. There's more truth than what meets the eye and not getting caught up in that game. So I I kind of probably am one of the most peaceful people in this country right now because I just sit in the middle in peace knowing that I'll know. You can really get stressed out paying too much attention to all of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Any other great stories you want to share? One of the most... um, difficult was 10 it was two weeks after september 11th and i was at logan airport no civilians had been left you know let into anywhere near the airport and probably 200 swat guys and a bunch of dogs going through my makeup and bringing me into this holding room and making up Tom Brokaw and waiting, waiting for that first transcontinental flight from George Bush Sr. to make the first flight from Texas to Boston to get to come through that doorway at the gate, sit in a chair and do his makeup 
so that he could open the airways for the American people. And that was one of those moments where I was shaking. I was teary. I was crying, afraid. His courage, that flight, seeing him get off the plane, wiping the sweat off of his forehead, and and just seeing, seeing the courage of a former American president. The weight of the world must have been on his shoulders at that very moment. I felt the impact of that on a on a way that was so like profound for me that I realized then that like when people say, "Oh, you do makeup," I'm like, "Please don't make this frivolous. Don't I, discredit. Don't what discredit I do. the the power of the makeup brush, please." I honor it because it has brought me into places that most people would never, ever, ever be able to go to. And that story still makes you emotional today. Yeah, I'm like Terry right now. 19 years later. Yeah, I'm Terry right now because, um, yeah, it kind of reminds me of now. You know, we were all shocked. Right. And put in a state of shock. And like, there's certain people that step out in front and to be there as behind the scenes supportive staff for people that have to do courageous things is an honor. So one of the biggest highlights in terms of presidential candidates was Hillary Clinton. Of course. And what you were able to do for her. People were thinking that she'd had surgery, Botox, <laughs> that she slept 24 hours prior. Yeah. Tell us Face about lit. the makeup you did for her and the lipstick you <clears throat> created. Absolutely. So I didn't know at the so that was the first debate with CNN and uh here in New Hampshire and I didn't know if I was going to be doing Hillary Clinton's makeup or not. And I had never done her makeup before and I was secretly hoping I could cuz I think she's beautiful. So I had everything kind of organized in my makeup kit in a way that I'd be ready to have to move rapidly if she was late. And I got into her holding room and I was going to have a half hour which from an artist's perspective like me, that is like so much time to do beautiful, beautiful art that's very intuitive and very, very relaxing for her. And that's what I wanted it to be. So I opened up my kit and we sat down and we introduced ourselves to each other. And Huma came up and... Abedin. Yes. Huma Abedin came up and handed me her lipstick. Her right-hand woman. Yes. And she had the lipstick turned up and she handed it to me. And as an artist, I'm like looking at Hillary and I'm looking at this soft, like lemon yellow shell over a black blazer. And I'm like, how soft and pretty. I had a color palette in mind. And when I looked over at the lipstick, I I felt sick to my stomach. I could feel it in my solar plexus. I could feel it in my stomach like it was wrong. Like it's not the right color for her. And I boldly said, I'm not feeling it. And then Hillary looked at me. And she said, then do what you feel. And she sort of like lifted her head and closed her eyes and just gave me her face. And And trusted you. She closed her eyes and relaxed and enjoyed every minute of her time to meditate or process her thoughts or just be quiet in her mind. And I went into my kit and I, I just danced. And I had all this new light reflective makeup that I had never used on HD. And let me tell you, this is the first time CNN was broadcasting in HD. There were a lot of weird factors. And a lot of pressure on I you then. I had never used that makeup before on TV and in CNN and never broadcast in HD. And you'd never done Hillary Clinton. And I'd makeup. never done Hillary Clinton. And I just took a deep breath and I know the makeup angels were with me. I, I just painted away. Now, when it got to the lips... There wasn't one specific color in my line that I felt was right. So I did what I felt and I used three of my colors and I mixed them. One was a little bronze, one was a little plum, one was a little red. And I mixed it on the back of my hand and I painted it on her lips and I thought, wow, this this is something. And I stepped back and I just knew that moment she was done. And then she went out. And I I didn't know anything until the next morning when my first client the next morning for CNN's early, early show was Ariana Huffington. So she like comes in and she goes, what did you do last night? Now, I'm not so confident in myself that my first thought wasn't, "Uh uh-oh, another Al Gore situation. And I was like, "What, what, what do you mean? And she said, 
what you did on Hillary Clinton last night is 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 remarkable, magical, and everyone's thinking she had a facelift, and no one can understand what she's done. But they realize it's what the makeup artist did. And that makeover got me the job. Like a few days later, CNN said, you know, would you like to be the chief of makeup for special events? And I said, what does that mean? And that means traveling the country for 18 months, doing every debate, being the lead makeup artist for all of all of the conventions, everything. And meanwhile, I'm a mom. I have three kids. I have a husband at home. This meant great sacrifice. Sure. And great opportunity. Sometimes great opportunity comes with great sacrifice. And um, I... He didn't ask me if I wanted the job. He told me I had it. A whole new path opened up for me in terms of um, what my artistry had created for her, too. You know, the the beauty in her was seen. And uh, what an incredible election cycle that was. What do you think of her as a woman, as a politician? Oh, well... I have to tell you that in 2007 and 2008, I loved her so much and I defended her so much. People have so many varying opinions. And what I encountered in Hillary Clinton was a warmth, a kindness, uh, a connectivity. What a great listener. She didn't need to remember things we talked about over makeup. And then a month later, we'd be at another debate and she would say how she'd follow up with details that a woman doing what she was doing had no business to have to remember. But the sense of listening and connectivity was incredible. And, you know, people used to have their opinions to me and they'd And this was hard because, you know, all the press that I got, people felt they needed to tell me what they thought about Hillary Clinton. And many times, you know, I was just like, I felt like I was constantly redirecting people's remarks and energy. Either people loved her and were like, oh, gosh, Chris, that's so great. You know, or they they were making some snide comment. And then I'd have to say, you have no idea who she is as a woman. And I think that's what happens in politics is that like we we lose respect because of judgment for the human being that is driving with courage, doing a thing that most people would never venture to do. No, they wouldn't. And I, I tried to, I don't get into the politics, to be honest with you. I'm into the people. I'd be pretty confused, wouldn't I be? If I had to know the politics behind everybody, when I, I would miss the opportunity to connect with the authentic person behind the politics. That's what I care about. That's who I'm serving. That's who I'm face to face with. And it's behind the scenes. So it's real. You've touched up the makeup for President Trump, but you didn't work with him as a clean slate. Explain that. (laughs) And everyone asked me about this, about his hair, about his face, about everything. And let's just get let's set the record straight on Trump. Okay. Um, He's not high maintenance. Really? No. He's not high maintenance. And he knows what he likes. He has been, if you look back, he has been combing and styling his hair in the exact same pattern. He's consistent. But he, he won't update the look either. He does. He, it's his signature look. I, I, I look at this. You know, some people just never, ever change the way they do things. They're iconic. Let's use that word for Trump. Iconic. Let's take all the politics out of it. I'm going to talk to you about him as a person. Okay. He's iconic in his style. All right. And everybody expresses themselves in the way that they feel is how they like to see themselves when they look in the mirror. You know, sometimes when things change and you can't control them, it's really uncomfortable. But like he's had the same amount of hair on his head his whole life. So he combs it the same exact way and styles it the same way. And, you know, I'm sure he looks in the mirror and he sees the exact same hairstyle and that's comfortable and that's safe. And that's just the look. So his hair's done. Okay. Then he's always bronzed. So because it's white around the eyes, I'm going to assume two things. And I never really personally asked him. I don't need to know. It's pretty straightforward. He either gets spray tanned or he does tanning. 
and the eyes are covered. Okay, and that's what it is. So it looks a little orangey. So I'm thinking spray tan instead of tanning bed. It's it's or outdoor tanning. But I know for me, like in in the pale of winter, I look at myself and I'm like, I I just can't. I just can't look at myself like that. I always want to put a little bronzer on in the winter. But it's a little excessive. Yeah, of course it is. But he's a character. Yes, he's a character. So what I'm what I'm saying is when it comes to his makeup, he's already warmed up. What I got to do is take like a powder to cool off the warm and just get the eye socket area to match. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then just mattify a little bit. It's a one step thing. I and I take I the brush Chris. down over the jawline into the ear a little bit. So when he looks side to side, everything's good. Imagine me in that low maintenance that you had to do one thing to your face every day and it's color correcting and it's one step. Efficient, quick. And it, it, it is. And, and the other thing about him, let's talk about his energy and like what I found when I met him. I get him and I, I'll tell you why. And I'm just, I'm not talking politics. I'm not talking anything here. I'm talking as a person. I get him. He is very focused on the next thing he needs to do and very multitasking. And so makeup is more like, okay, hi, hi, nice to meet you. Great. Are you almost done? All right. Awesome. And then he's working on something over here. He's working on something over here. You're getting him done. Done? Great. Doesn't even look in the mirror care. Trust because he's on. He's off to his next thing. So it's very fast it's very very fast and thank thank goodness he doesn't need multiple steps to get him there did you ever give him any suggestions no i i i didn't need to there's nothing i mean i suppose if i could have gotten into a conversation about the orange being too orange i can't imagine somebody hasn't talked to him about that or that hasn't been mentioned to him a million times Or he hasn't seen the million tweets and the millions and millions of people that that really believe that his skin tone is a little too orange or his spray tan isn't the right shade or whatever. And I think that's been rectified because I don't notice it so much anymore. He seems pretty even and his eyes are evened out. But when it comes to like looking at him like any other person that sits before me. He's low maintenance, highly motivated, multitasking, a lot, big, big, big aura energy, huge aura energy, huge. And so I get why he's where he's at. It's a Bill Clinton energy, that kind of Bill, that kind of energy, that aura, that power, that magnitude. And I'm talking when you're face to face and you're touching his face and like you're feeling what this, this human being is radiating. And um, and that's my experience with them. And it's no accident that you're in that position for certain reasons. You got there because of some of those qualities that you have. Well, yes, yes. And and it's interesting. Candidates like Donald Trump, um, I, I crossed uh, two paths with Donald Trump. I was at that final press conference here in New Hampshire on the opioid crisis, uh, sitting about four feet from him. And I had written him a very, very long letter about what I wanted to see happen in this country with the opioid crisis. And after I was able to hand him um, the letter and go, hi, you, I might look familiar because I'm the same girl that's done your makeup, but I'm also here. And Amber, my stepdaughter, you know, has, you know, died of an overdose. And I've been very, very influential in advocating for help for that population. And He's, he took the letter and he put it in his, in his breast pocket and he said, I will read every word. And I know he did. You know, so my connectivity has also bridged into some, some strange things, meeting with other parts of my life. And one of, one of the other ones was doing um, – I was hired to do makeup for CBS for uh, a special and I was going to be making up um, Governor Chris Christie. And, uh, and the CBS folks. And then I was, 
uh, asked by CBS to be on a panel for the opiate crisis. That was the same gig. That's when I really knew my world, my worlds were colliding as a makeup artist and an advocate when I was doing makeup for the exact same show that I was going to be on. And, um, you know, that's when I know that that original voice that said you're going to be a makeup artist was so much more than makeup. It was about like, we are going to use that makeup brush as a power tool to change the world. We are going to change the world with this makeup brush. And I know that that's what's happened because that shelter, Amber's Place, that I was building in the middle of the primary, that I was talking to President Trump, you know, well, Donald Trump at the time about Chris Christie, every single candidate heard Amber's story, were all part of the press and the momentum that helped me raise $100,000 in this community and open uh, an emergency shelter on a word from Hillary Clinton gave me the empowerment. She gave me the empowerment to do it. She told me right before I did her makeup, I told her about Amber's death and she said, I had had a dream about the shelter and I woke up and I was going to do Hillary Clinton's makeup that morning. And I told her about my dream of this emergency shelter, like a red cross emergency thing. And being an EMT, I'm very tuned into running two emergencies. And she, she just touched my arm and she said, Chris, chase your dreams. And I went forward and that hundred thousand dollars opened up the first in the nation emergency respite for the opioid crisis the city of Manchester, when it saw what we were doing and how many people were helping, met it. And I found it and ran it for six months until, you know, it got taken over, which it needed to because the momentum was incredible. And here we are four years later and 8,000 people have come through, wow. which is now um, the doorway is safe station. Manchester Fire Department's amazing. They open their doors to screen and they would bring them to Amber's place. And- <laughs> We took Amber's name off of it after the six months when it got moved to different nonprofits. But I sat on the board of Easter Seals Farnham Center for three years fighting for them to take it because I knew it would be sustainable there. And uh, I left the board when, in fact, it became the emergency stabilization unit there and then worked there as an EMT and a coach with these people for a year on my day off on Monday, um, kind of like giving birth and fostering, you know, fostering out or giving your, your child up for adoption. And then you go to live in the house for a while to make sure that it ended up in a safe place. And it did. And to date, yeah, there are over 8,000 have been helped through the program that started as a result of that dream. And Hillary Clinton saying to me, chase your dream and a community that believed in what I was doing and the place I was coming from in my heart to, to make it accessible for people to get treatment that didn't have insurance or um, were underinsured and that were on the brink of death. Just some background. She was your stepdaughter. You lost to a heroin overdose in 2014. Yes. Yes. Could you share her story with us? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll say that um, she was in my life for, uh, Five years before she passed, uh, I met her father, um, and I was delighted. You know, that first date was, oh, we talked about our kids. You know, I said, I have I have three sons, you know, and he said, I have one daughter. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I always wanted a daughter, you know? And uh, he said, well, don't get too excited. Um, and I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, she's really not that well. So she was already not that well when I met her. Um, it started with over-the-counter Benadryl. Um and then it went to alcohol, marijuana, and then it went to buying opiate pills on the street, prescription pills. And and sort of the whole underlying thing was that she had untreated bipolar disorder. And any time that she would be brought to get help and get on medication, she didn't like the way she felt. So she would stop taking the medication. So she was self-treating. That's what the Benadryl was all about. She was trying to find a way to make herself feel comfortable in her skin. And she couldn't. And um, so the opiate pills turned into uh, a straight IV use. And we would find out pieces later. Um, you know, she had four incarcerations in the last two years of her life. Two were heroin possession. But the last two were were very interesting. They were prostitution charges. 
And we couldn't really figure out what was going on. You know, we had a beautiful house for her to come live in. She could have had everything and anything she wanted in terms of education or anything. Um, but she would never stay for more than one or two nights because she'd start to detox and she'd leave us a note, disappear in the middle of the night and say, I have to go back to my people. Her people were the homeless people on the streets of Manchester. And that was her, those were her people. That was her culture. That's where she felt most purposeful. And that's where she lived and she was comfortable under bridges and she liked helping people um, that were homeless and uh, we never knew how popular she was until she died at her wake. Uh, when we put it out on the streets that everyone homeless in the city, you know, was welcome to come and 500 people showed up. We didn't think more than 30 would come, just immediate family. And it was remarkable to hear people come through at her service saying, she detoxed me under a bridge on the coldest night of the winter. She gave me the coat off of her back. She loved me when no one else would. And these people were broken. And I realized, like, she had, like, a ministry on the street. And she was the girl that helped everybody else but could not help herself because she suffered from addiction. So um, we later found out that she was a victim of human trafficking. That wow. the only reason that she was picked up on prostitution was that she was being sold and paid in heroin to keep her addiction going. Um, we got all this story after the fact, and it all started to come together that, you know, she was she was a victim of of all of this, you know, and her her death that, you know, to see my love for my husband is so like out of this world and to see him lose his only child. And he is a magical, magical man. And to see his light dim. I think that's what lit my fire. I said, I've got to do something. Her death will not be in vain. And I believe that her spirit drove me in ways that are not human. When I look back on the things that I did to pull things together to do this, it, it is divine. It is not me. Like I, I know like I can, I can get things done, but the thing I was called to do was amazing. And if not for the makeup brush and the presidential candidates and getting the word out, no one would know. Right. You had their ears. And I think in some ways, a, a lot came up against me because I was the big mouth telling the truth. And and that is that's that to me at that level is very, like, very difficult. It's very difficult to be an advocate because, you know, there's so much there's one side that wants things better. And there's another side that doesn't, you know, there's there's a side that's part of the problem. And there's a side that's part of the solution. And in this division and this tension, I stood in that middle place trying to understand. And what I found is that I believe in life. And I believe in life. And that's why I say like when, an, you know, a woman's complaining about the signs of aging, Amber will never know what it's like to look at her face at 55 years old and see wrinkles. Exactly. So like, doesn't that just like cut all of this superficial Bullshit vanity? Away. Like, let's just cut all our vanity out. Like my life experience is why I have a voice on beauty today the way I do. It's been molded by my experiences, some of which have been so hard. It's really hard to come back and beautify people and talk about makeup and beauty when you've just lost your stepdaughter and like run a business that's built on something like that when, you know, like at 23 years old, you know, her life was complete. But let me tell you, her, her life, her mission, her spirit has changed the world. And I knew that when I was asked, uh, Mark and I were asked to go down and share her story before Congress to open the National Task Force for the Opiate Crisis by Congresswoman Annie Custer, who's a client and friend of mine. And... um you know, it's these relationships with my, you know, with one of our Congresswomen, intimate relationships. I've cried in, in, in Congresswoman Custer's arms after Amber died. And like just the, the way, the synchronicity of things, of being in Washington, D.C. and seeing her picture up in the same place where you see like, Nancy Pelosi. Right. Speaking from right now, that podium right there, Amber's picture was right there and her story was told in those walls. And um, that blows my mind. That's where, 
you know, I say this is makeup on a mission. This, this, this makeup brush of mine has done more than just paint faces and put lipstick on people. It has changed the world. And, and the spirit of beauty is that, you know, it's these behind the scenes conversations and these authentic conversations that have changed the world. It's getting down, getting real with people and people that feel like in their soul that they believe in life and they believe in the best for people are the ones that took that message to the next level that made the change. People like Annie Custer. So, so you see, like when I think about some of the behind the scenes uh, relationships that I have with politicians, some of them are really close friends, really close friends. And I don't care what their politics are because I know that they believe in what's best for, for families and for human life. And, and that's where my politics lies. You know, that's where my politics lies in people. So let's end by discussing your spirituality, because I believe that's a big part of who you are. Who are you spiritually? Like, do you believe in God? Yes. Where, where are you in your head? I am, I am 100% God conscious when I'm not letting my ego run the show. And I say that because I'm a human being. And I have been evolving through my whole life spiritually. And I come from a melting pot of religion. And I I like to make the distinction between religion and spirituality, you know, because like, to me, religion is sort of man made and spirituality is something that's every single one of our birthright. I just know that I believe in God, because when I pray, magical things happen. I get results from my time behind closed doors. I'm I've been meditating for probably 28 years now, faithfully every day, morning, night, and sometimes during the day, I take little breaks where I just, I just connect to, you know, that God within, you know, and anything that I ask for, I might not get what I want, but I know when I, I pray for strength, I get it. When I pray for courage, I get it. When I need an answer, I get it. Um, And when I pray for miracles for other people, I get it. And I've seen so many miracles in my life. So I believe that I have evolved to appreciate things in this world that are purely God and namely nature. I have a strong affection for for animals, for nature, for the sky, for the weather, (laughs) Um, for rocks and stones and crystals and fire. And and it sounds kind of... um, shamanic, I guess. But those are the things I turn to when the world seems erratic to me, which is often. I feel very grounded when I'm barefoot standing on earth and I'm taking a deep breath of air and I'm letting the sun hit my face and I'm letting go of the things of the world. And then I'm getting centered there. And so I believe that that's where I find God or or my my spirituality. I've entertained a lot of different religions and all that, and I find beauty in them all. But I'm I'm a makeup artist. I touch every religion there is. I I have got to find a commonality with everybody. I cannot afford to judge one religion over another, lest I be judgmental about the person that I'm in front of, and I, I can't have impact that way. So I kind of think that like, my religion is is beauty, and it's the beauty in us all. It's the thing that connects us, not the thing that separates us. So it's really hard to talk about. Even talking about it is very ethereal. You know, I'm I kind of consider myself sort of a Christian Buddhist mystic with a little shaman thrown in. So what is that? You know, I'm I'm a collection of every face I've ever painted. I I get a piece of truth from everybody that I connect with on a deep level. And so that's what I become is that part of everyone I've touched, which means I'm an independent bipartisan lover of people and life. 
you know, that's, that's my religion. And I, I, th- I like to see like how, how people's faith and belief manifests in their actions. It's something that you feel. And it feels beautiful when you feel it. Learn more about drug addiction resources through the Farnham Center at farnhamcenter.org. That's F-A-R-N-U-M. Chris Cosmetics is online at chriscosmetics.com. K-R-I-S-S. And look for the feature article on Chris in the August issue of Allure magazine. Do you have a compelling story or do you know someone I should interview? Drop me a line at diaryofanation at gmail.com. Please tell a friend to listen to. That's how we grow our audience and continue podcasting. Find Diary of a Nation through your favorite podcast app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Diary of a Nation.